Hi, I'm Raymond Centeno, and I am a part of the leadership for Filipino Force at Salesforce. We are standing here at Salesforce Park, and right behind me is Salesforce Tower, which is the tallest building in San Francisco. Salesforce Park is an urban park right in the middle of the city. So if you're ever here, in the, if you ever come to San Francisco, come out here and enjoy a nice walk on the park. Now, Salesforce is actually located in the south of market area of San Francisco. And this area has significance for the Filipino community. Uh, this is actually, SOPA is actually, has been designated a Filipino cultural district for San Francisco. We are located just a few blocks away from Yerba Buena Park, which is where Stahan is held in person. Um, and if you walk around the neighborhood, you will see various signs of the history of the Filipinos here in, the, in San Francisco. As part of the Innovation Pavilion, we are pleased to welcome a few uh, trailblazing Filipinos in tech who would like to speak with us about their experiences being in the tech industry. What is your role at your company? I'm the Vice President of Investor Relations at Asana. And in case you don't know, Asana is a software company. We provide work management software so that you've got a navigation system of all the work in your company. Uh, and as an individual, you can project manage your day-to-day -day work. And as a company, you can set goals and navigate through all the different work streams that lead up to those goals. I'm a senior manager for the sales compensation systems team. We manage the systems and tools that are used to pay our salespeople. There are a lot of questions around ERGs. Um, for Faster, um, I'm the founder and national board president. I also was named um, on the leadership team of Asian Leaders Alliance, which, which is a coalition of over 200 plus Asian American Pacific Islander tech and corporate employee resource groups. So within Faster, we have a component, uh, Faster Pros, that's really focused on helping support uh, new and up and coming employee resource groups, having some of the older ones mentor new ones. Um, so as part of my position within ALA, it's to make sure the Filipino American community is represented within the broader Asian American and Pacific Islander community. Yeah, so I, I lead a, t a team that's called Encoding Technologies. So hopefully many of you are familiar with Netflix. Um, and so when you're watching Netflix, you see videos and you listen to the audio of your sh favorite show or movie. Um, and so we're responsible for generating all that media. So our team writes software that runs on the cloud um, and does research to related to that so that all the Netflix members um, get the best experience when they're watching. Um, and then you also have all the images on, on the website and your app, we produce those images. Um, now that we're also a, producing our own movies um, on the studio side, you need a lot of media technology for that too. So, so my team also builds uh, the technologies that, for example, processes the files coming from the cameras, creating some dailies where direct, uh, directors of photography need, need to review the, mo the movie or the shot for the day. So we also build software and services on the back end for the production process. So I work on the geodata operations team. So essentially, we are responsible for keeping Google Maps up to date. So for example, through all of the COVID, um, all the work that's been going on with COVID with businesses being opened or closed and all that, that is our team. We are responsible for ensuring that roads are all on our maps, that businesses, you know, open, close and whatnot are, are kept up to date. That's kind of what our team does. For me specifically, um, I work on the strategy side of consuming third party data operation, third party data. So, for example, if the World Health Organization comes to us and says, hey, we have a list of all of these hospitals in, I don't know, in in Bangladesh, they can give that to my team. And what my team does is we try to get that onto Google Maps so that people can find um, whatever it is if, for in this example, hospitals um, from the WHO we can actually get those up on Google Maps. So I work on the strategy of actually making that happen, making it easier for, uh, for third parties to contribute to our map.
Well, <laughs> so my role at GA, I am an events producer. So pre-COVID, I was doing events in person at my space. And then since the pandemic started, I've been doing virtual events since last, last March, since March of 2020. Um, I've done over 100 events with GA, and I love uh, all the people that I've met. And for Kumu, I also do virtual events, but it's a different format through um, in-app, on the phone or um, streaming software streaming. So it's for me, like being on the screen, being a host to certain things has been quite natural. Um, even though we've all been working from home, I kind of take it a, a, a different, I take a different step there and like, you know, while people are just working, I'm actually producing things for people to watch. So that's my role at GA. And it's it's been quite a ride knowing that a lot of the content that I put out there onto the internet can potentially influence something, can influence someone. So that's that's my role. And um, basically just for brand awareness, you know, it's it's not um, it's it's not again, like I said before, it wasn't a um a field that I thought I would get into, but I'm loving it. How did you get into the tech industry? Yes, um, I started in technology very, very early on. I um, graduated from Stanford in 1990, and my first job was actually on the financial services side of technology. I was at a bank called Robertson Stevens, uh, based in San Francisco, and we were doing deals with um, software companies, uh, including Oracle Corporation, Microsoft. So back then it was enterprise software. And that was my launch into technology. It was early, things have changed. It was before the internet and now it's just exploded since. So I started my journey 20 years ago as a programmer for Accenture in the Philippines. Um, I started with every intention of working for two years and pursuing further studies. So it, meant, it was meant to be like a placeholder in my long-term career journey. I ended up enjoying it so much. I stayed for 10 years, mostly for the same client as well, and worked my way up from programmer to becoming a lead and eventually managing projects. I left that and moved to San Francisco um, when I got married. And I, you know, because that was all I had on my resume, that was the job that I ended up finding. Um, I started working as a contractor for Salesforce, and then I eventually moved to be a full-time um, employee on the sales compensation team. Sure. So being born and raised in Silicon Valley, you learn how to code when you're like five. Um, so I was really fortunate that I had proficiency in programming. I did spend five years uh, early in my career and on the path of civic engagement. I thought I was going to be an IP and immigration lawyer. I always thought I'd come back into the tech industry, but I actually ended up working for uh, Congressman Rokana's first race when he was still the former Deputy U.S. Secretary of Commerce. And my direct report boss was the founder of Tech for Obama, Steve Spinner. So through that, I was really reintroduced introduced to Silicon Valley uh, later in life. And I realized I really loved programming um, and design. So I went back into the field. I ended up turning down, um, co-founding the tech campaign office for the Hillary campaign super PAC and really focusing on augmented and virtual reality. So uh, to my, I guess, right is uh, the cover of my book, um, creating AR VR. Uh, it's in 24 countries and um, three different languages. Uh, so through that, you know, really focused on emerging tech, AR, VR, and then AI, artificial intelligence. I also have been investing heavily into cryptocurrency and blockchain the last few years, um, really focused on, you know, all different parts from, you know, early uh, stage building product um, to deployment. And, and now I'm building an investment fund uh, for our community, primarily focused on creative film and, and tech, um, particularly emerging tech. So, yeah. Uh, you, you know, when I was growing up in Manila, we maybe like a lot of you, you're made to sing and dance. And, you know, I could not carry a tune. They said I had to go into pressure cooker because my I was dancing so hard. So I, that wasn't for me. Um, as uh, you're, you know, going into medicine, I would faint, almost fainted when they were drawing blood. So I knew that wasn't for me, too. Uh, yeah, my, my family was in marketing and that, you know, being able to have good ideas about selling soap or shampoo I was really bad at it but you know when I was doing my math books like I was just so engaged 
when I took my first computer computer science courses, um, I also would like come home and just finish my project after a, a college party. So I just knew that this was very interesting to me. Um, and so that's how I got into tech. And so after college, I figured I wanted to learn more and try to find the best places to study um, and to learn more. And that's how I ended up in doing my, my graduate studies um, and then eventually working in Silicon Valley. Accidentally, completely. I was a med school dropout who ended up uh, majoring basically in the sciences, which meant I was good at math. So I ended up on Wall Street. Uh, while on Wall Street, um, a few, you know, I was working, very happy. Uh, one day a Google recruiter reached out and said, hey, we like your profile. We think you'd be really good to join our finance team here at Google. I looked at the job description, said, if you'd like to waste your time, since I am underqualified, that's fine. I'll, I'll go with it. And, you know, we'll waste time together. Uh, fast forward <laughs> to offers. And that's how I ended up at Google. So how I got to technology was not the most obvious. OK, getting into technology for me was never a plan. Um, but I have to say that I've loved technology from the gate. When I was younger, I, I coded. I was on Adobe. I was designing. I was doing graphic design. I was doing HTML and creating websites for my friends in high school. So the computer, video games, especially Game Boy, technology has always been there. Um, it's been um, a thing for me to use, especially with phones and things like that. So going into the technology industry, however, was completely by surprise. I was doing events um, primarily for a number of years. I was in biotech for a long time. So I was working on uh, different chemotherapy drugs for my patients. I was at a, at a major hospital here in San Francisco. And when I decided to leave the health industry and go into something else, events seem to be the most um, ideal thing for me. I love doing events and producing. And this opportunity at Gen General Assembly was basically what got me into the tech industry, even though General Assembly is not necessarily tech, um, it's tech ed. So, but even then, like the events I produce, um, it ran from like data to UX to AI. It really exposed me to different parts of tech. So yeah, that's how I got into it. It was through events and then I got this opportunity and here I am. How did you get involved in your employee resource group? Oh, I jumped right in. I started at Asana uh, in April of 2020. And um, as one of the few Filipinas who hold executive positions in the tech space right now, I know how important it is to, um, to bring any kind of leadership, mentorship, involvement that you can into the tech sector. The numbers are starting to go up in terms of the number of Asian Pacific Islanders who are in tech companies. But just to give you some perspective, when I was an undergrad, there were only three Filipina women in my class. And I think now there's probably you know, 20 or 30. So we're still working on it, but it's come really a long way. And I think some of that uh, with with further education um, in secondary education, there are more and more Asian Americans and Filipinos in tech companies. Now we're trying to move people upstream into more executive positions. So I got involved in our ERG immediately. We had an ERG called Gradient, which is for all um, for all uh, diverse uh, groups within uh, Asana. And just recently, we actually created a new specific one for Asian Pacific Islanders called Asana Pack. We have about 100 people and it's just growing as we speak. Uh, so I helped to lead that group so that there's a lot of accountability within the management team to make sure we're not just checking the boxes on things, but actually going really deep into the purpose and mission for the ERG. So when I moved to San Francisco several years ago, I really only knew the people that I worked with and a couple of other friends from school. And, you know, it's very much in our nature as Filipinos to look for other Filipinos. And that was one of the things I got tagged on a chatter post inviting everyone to ice cream. And um, that was it. That was the beginning of the Filipino force. Filipino force is the name of our current employee group, we used to call it Filipino Ohana. Um, that was the beginnings of the 
of our ERG, I started becoming a lot more involved over the past year when I wanted to do more and actually had more time because of our, um, you know, everybody being remote and cutting out that commute time meant I could devote more time to ERGs. Yeah, I, I'm, I don't have a floor, you know, with, with Netflix, um, we do things organically from ground up. So um, I'm part of the Kababayans at Netflix. And, you know, just when we think there's a good opportunity to organize the community for events. Um, yeah, so that's what I did. So I, a, a few years ago, I organized together with Faster, um, Pinoy's our Filipinos in tech event at Netflix. And that was um, together with other Kababayans. And we had like a few hundred uh, Filipinos in tech gathered in, in our auditorium and where we gave lightning talks. And it was like one of the more fulfilling events I've ever done, right? Just seeing similar faces in one room, eating, I think we had fun sit in, in some um, crispy pata and, um, and just that and had like cheap knee swag. But then we're talking very much, we were also very passionate talking about the tech that we build in Silicon Valley. And that was just very fulfilling. Yeah, so, um, you know, I come from born and raised in New York, South Side, Jamaica, Queens all day. Uh, and I didn't come from a lot of money. You know, my parents immigrated here. Uh, my mom's side is 12 brothers and sisters. My dad's side's 13. So we didn't come from a lot of money. And how I really got to where I am is through nonprofit organizations such as Prep for Prep. So because I'm such a pay it forward kind of person, I'm thankful for the opportunities others had provided to me. Uh, I wanted to make sure that throughout my professional career, I was doing the same, reaching back and helping with others. So when I joined Google and I found out it was my first time in my working career that I had found a Filipino specific working group, like employee group in a company, I was like, oh, bet, jumped right on it. So that's how I got involved with um, the Filipino Googler Network, FGN. All right. <clears throat> ERG work was something that was not in my wheelhouse. I was just, I was not even thinking about it. But then again, looking at the work that I've done for the community, um, you know, with the Filipino community, I've always been that, that person to kind of, you know, speak up or be or show up right and you know knowing that tech does not have a huge filipino population i mean there's asians all over tech there's asians all over tech but the filipino population in tech a little lower you know because a lot of us have been um influenced to go into the medical field or be a lawyer or be a teacher but tech is something very new um but look at the philippines you know it's gosh, like leaps and bounds, um, the progress of tech there. Almost everybody in the Philippines has a phone. Um, lots of talent is, is, being, um, is being found in the Philippines. So it's, it was just natural for me to kind of raise my hand when they said, okay, we're starting ERGs or we're starting, well, ERGs had always been there, but when GA said, we're looking for leadership to lead these ERGs. I raised my hand thinking, oh, it's gonna be easy, but God, it's, it's work, it's work. So how I got into the Asian ERG where I, I am a program lead, um, it was just basically me saying like, if no one else is gonna do it, who's gonna do it? Me? I guess I'll do it. And then when I got into it, I'm like, oh crap, you know, like this is more than just putting on events. It's actually, you know, advocating for our people. It's, you know, speaking up for those in our company who aren't being treated fairly. It's, it's bringing up issues that people would rather not talk about and um, lifting up those in, in our leadership positions and having them tell their stories. And again, like the, the events that I produce for the public, I was kind of hoping that, you know, people within our own company are able to speak out and tell their story. So storytelling has always been such an important part of my work and, and part of my, um, part of my mission. And, you know, through the events that I do through the ERG work that I do, I, I was, my, my goal was to tell those stories. Do you have any recommendations for Filipinos uh, interested in entering the tech industry? Yes. Yes. 
I would say start early, aim high, and get involved. The, uh, the tech sector does require a lot of education. Uh, you, you don't have to be, you could be a coder, you could be a developer, but you don't have to be. In the tech sector, there are more business people than there are uh, developers. So there are many, many roles that you can take. I think the tech sector is super important because with innovation, there's growth and with growth, there's career opportunity. So I'm a big fan of all of my Filipino uh, cohorts to come into the tech sector because I believe that's where we're gonna find the best career opportunities, um, improve economic welfare for, for, um, for ourselves uh, because where there's growth, there's more opportunity. So I would say get started early, aim high, build your network and not just with other Filipinos, but with everyone in the company. And I think in some ways it can be contrary to the, what we're taught culturally, which is stay in your place, be obedient, stay quiet. But I think that as a Filipina, I would go out there and I would say every week I should strive to get introduced to somebody new who can be a, not just a mentor, but even someone who can teach you more about an industry. So there should be starting early networking and getting educated and aiming high. You know, um, if I were to have anything to say, if, if I had any advice to give, it would be to ask questions. Um, I actually make a very conscious effort as a parent to introduce my kids to different concepts, different careers. When I first started um, in Accenture, it was very much not a woman's job to be in technology. Um, everyone just thought, you know, it was a man's job to do programming. Um, women were more stereotyped towards the marketing roles or, you know, people, a lot of people thought I would just go be a teller at a bank. Um, I was surprised that I was interested in that I enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, I had very good mentors, very strong mentors who encouraged me to continue down the route of technology. And, you know, if I were to look back, I would say asking a lot of questions, um, being exposed to a lot of different career options, attending career fairs was a big deal for me and finding mentors along the way who would guide you through your career goals and help answer questions um, is a big thing. I continue to actually mentor a couple of people who I used to work with. Um, way back during my Accenture days. And that's been really good for me also to see like what other opportunities are available to, you know, my friends back in the Philippines because I have a very different view working here as opposed to um, them back home. So for at least faster from K-12 through uh, college, so undergraduate students, whether you're pivoting from a different industry uh, or you're thinking about starting a company, we really look at the life cycle of a Filipino holistically. So wherever you are, you know, starting from even before you're born, we have a lot of faster moms that are pregnant right now, you know, that are making sure they're watching machine learning videos and hoping they're going to be a programmer or, you know, maybe a tech CEO someday. Um, it really doesn't matter. You know, uh, tech is so broad, it intersects with many different other industries. Um, and so I think, you know, all skill sets are welcome. You don't need to learn how to code C++ and be an amazing programmer to be contributing to this industry. In fact, many of, you know, our leading experts, you know, whether it's a virtual reality, augmented reality, are actually designers who study painting. So there's a lot of different ways uh, to get involved. Yeah, I think the one thing I would say is just don't be intimidated, right? Um, unfortunately, we especially in the on the engineering side right um, where you're coding or you know being an engineering leader unfortunately we don't see a lot of faces like us um, in that in that world and sometimes that could be intimidating but you know it's not not necessarily our fault right this is because how you know because of the um, opportunities or the lack of privilege that has been been given to our community. So the first thing is just don't be intimidated. Um, you have a lot of strengths. Um, you know, there's obviously the technical strengths that you bring, 
but there are other parts of your your upbringing of our you know people's personalities that also bring a lot of value into the job in tech aside from the technical part right so i could think about just the resourcefulness or scrappiness that we grow up with like i personally i don't want to generalize it i personally grew up with with my family right you being being a resourceful and scrappy is important when you're building efficient systems um your resistance like changes and being able to adapt that's also very important um and of, of course there's also like i like i know from my own family how my my especially the women are very very social and are good at networking and be are very empathetic and so i think that also brings even though that's not a technical skill that really improves the the work you bring and the value to bring to the company so if, as a whole i think like as Filipinos, we do bring a lot of value. And so, yeah, just uh, don't, don't don't be intimidated. And the other thing I'm thinking about, like maybe it's not as easy to find, of course, there's a lot of, you know, it, it's um, from my material, get, um, financially, it's rewarding to be in tech, but of course, a lot of people are also looking for a sense of purpose. And, you know, there are a lot of tech companies out there that you can choose from, that you can find a sense of purpose that not as obvious as like, curing curing cancer or being a doctor right but but like i'm as part of netflix like our, we use our platform to share stories around the world and like build the world closer together and so i find purpose in that so that's that's my other my other advice 100 percent um there are not a ton of us but for those of us who are in the tech space we are quite open to speaking and, you know, giving individuals advice. If you look at the, all the individuals who are participating in today's event, um, I think that alone shows you that there's a lot of Filipinos in tech that are eager and wanting more faces like ours to be in the space. So first and foremost, network, right? Like if you're not sure uh, what part of tech you want to be in, use that network to find people, find groups where you can get this information. Um, I think it was mentioned earlier, you don't have to be a software engineer to go into tech. As I mentioned earlier, I came from Wall Street, finance. We're talking head to toe, always had my makeup done, wore a suit every day to work, right? Complete different than what I wear now, which are yoga pants and t-shirts. Um, and I'm lucky if I brush my hair in the morning. This is an anomaly right now. So for, First piece of advice is network, find your, find, you know, find someone to help you kind of search and figure out what you want to get into. Two is not to be afraid and limit yourself to thinking that you just have to be a technical person. These are businesses, these tech companies, they need HR people, they need project managers, they need program managers, they, you know, they need assistant business, um, administrative business partners. Like, it's not just a software engineer. So that's my second piece of advice is you can find your space in the tech world if like you just need to dig a little bit and do a bit of research. This is a piece of advice or a mantra that I say at all of the events that I host, all the events that I am part of, which is Lift As You Climb. Um, I got that from at the Allison, Dr. Don Mabala and Angela Davis. And basically it means wherever you're at, whatever privileges that you have, you have to lift your people up with you. And I think because I'm in such a interesting and unique position that I get to throw events and you know be able to put on programming that, that address relevant information and topics, I'm given the opportunity to say, you know, we have the power to make a difference in whatever companies that we're at, no matter what industry, it could be tech, it, it could be culinary, it could be whatever. But the main goal is if you see somebody who looks like you, who have the same drive as you, and they want to do something positively impactful, bring them up with you. Um, and because I'm in tech ed, there's a lot of influence, right? There's a lot of things that we could say in our curriculum. Um, and I'm hoping that, you know, the teachings that we do have at GA, it will help someone understand people 
and how these people can influence tech because tech will influence how we live. You know, look at our phones. We have so many apps on the phone that can influence the way we work, the way we speak, the way we present ourselves. So if we are helping nurture a generation of tech leaders at GA, and we influence them in a way that will help society and get rid of racism and get rid of biases and that will break the social construct constructs social con <laughs> social constructs that will help break social constructs that were intentionally made to oppress people of color if GA has the power to do that and say, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to help people get up into leadership. Then, you know, Jay did his job. Not only are we, are we sending out a generation of people who are um, skillful, but we'll also have the mindset to help people of color. So. Have you been involved in the fight to stop AAPI hate? And has your company uh, done anything to help support this initiative? We do, we do a number of things. I think for, for us, we have a program called, we support a, a conscious leadership uh, program. We're, we train everyone internally. Um, that's not specific to Asian hate, but it is uh, a deeply ingrained cultural value for us to be very thoughtful about how we, um, how we handle situations, what our principles and base values are. So as a company, we have a committee that includes uh, a committee, including um, all of our executive management team, plus various, various roles in the company to screen through all of our customer base. Cause we have a self-serve uh, customer go to market um, motion. So at first you don't really know who's using that first version, you know, the first time they download the application, but we do screen through all of our all of our customer base and uh, make sure that we have philosophical alignment with the companies that are actually using the product and we're actually very active on that. So there's a number of um, things that we had turned off, um, including some people, some companies that and organizations that were involved with Asian hate. Um, we also actually go right to the individual. Um, our, our biggest push on sustainability is human, the human sustainability. Our software is all about helping people balance their lives better in their work and be able to bring more productivity and bring their heart and soul into work instead of just answering email and staying up all night doing work about work. And so along that same philosophy, we take very seriously the human element and how people feel about what's been going on. So right after a lot of this activity started, we created Asana Pack. We have about a hundred members in that group right now. Um, there's three things that happen, training, leadership, and voice. And I think you probably know what training and leadership is. So I'll just say with voice, we, um, we provide a number of forums, live forums, recorded forums, an Asana task, a Slack channel, where anyone can bring their personal experience, their feelings or emotions into, into that forum just for sharing. Um, this is not a small thing to do because many companies put a boundary around that, right? Whether it's about talking about politics at work or sharing a, a personal experience that deeply moved you positively or negatively. We actually take a different approach to that. We bring it in. So we had a number of town hall meetings and, um, and ERG meetings where people could actually just voice their anxieties about what's happening. Um, on the Slack channel, we share uh, safety tips. Or, but, but I think the most important thing is the knowing that you can share any personal emotion in these forums and you're, you are welcome to show up as you are and who you are. And that's what I hear most from our employees, that knowing that you can just come as you are and that the company is deeply committed to including all of you, 
into it. So that's a, that's how we responded. We have programmatic things on the business side, and then we have very personal, personal level forums and programs to help individuals feel welcome to, to come as they are and share their feelings. And it's been deeply, deeply moving, deeply moving. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why we do win a lot of awards, but our goal is not to win awards. I think the awards are the outcome of programs such as these. Like many other companies, Salesforce definitely has had a lot of initiatives um, in the fight against AAPI hate. On a personal note, it was uh, participating in equality circles that our ERGs have hosted both for um, my finance organization and the larger group of, for Salesforce as a whole. And then specifically for Filipino Force, we actually conducted an equality circle um, for just the Filipino Force audience. So knowing that um, you know, our, our view of the AAPI, AAPI hate issues were a little different from maybe what the larger um, community was experiencing. It was nice to connect um, at a more personal level with our fellow Filipinos on how they're affected by these um, by the hate crimes that were surrounding us. And then um, on a more team specific level, I was also involved in hosting and we continue to host um, what we call a let's talk series, which is like a 30 minute monthly meeting where everyone just speaks their mind. It was a way for us to connect um, and ensure that everyone was, you know, in a good state from a mental standpoint to, uh, as it related to a lot of these issues like COVID, API hate, um, et cetera. So through FASTER, uh, we've partnered with the YFPA, your Filipino professional organization, uh, sorry, your Filipino Professional Association. So through their uh, organization and ours, um, we decided to do uh, self-defense workshops with Escapa Daan, which is a San Francisco-based martial arts um, sort of community. And we'll be holding those workshops again um, for our annual conference uh, at FasterCon, uh, Saturday, was it Friday, October 8th. And we really wanna make sure, you know, our community uh, can defend itself, you know, in the face of hate from all the different hate crimes that are happening throughout the country from New York, uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, et cetera, the South. Um, we've also worked very closely with our community partners, Lead Filipino, who've been leading the fight at the state level, um, as well as local level to make sure there's listening sessions for folks that are, you know, really having a tough time, whether it's mental health, whether it's looking at health and safety and different policies, you know, local, state and national. Um, aside from that, um, the one other thing I would say with ALA and, you know, my leadership role there, as well as with with, um, my other board member, Charity Nicholas, who's also our national board secretary and is one of the highest ranking women you know, in health tech and safety. She's on track for partner at her company this year and you know, is also looking at the reopening policies. We wanna make sure that our communities feel safe um, and within that, you know, there's a lot of donations po pouring into the AAPI community, but a lot of that's not equally split within the Filipino American community. You know, just alone, whether it's Filipinos Feed the Frontlines, many other amazing campaigns, the tech industry is donating, but it's not going back towards locals. Uh, local state and community organizations specific to our community as a part of the broader AAPI community as much as it should be. So, you know, our leadership role there is really to be a part of those larger discussions as we're looking at multi-million dollar funds being distributed and really going towards the programs that are supporting community in a multi-tiered fashion. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Honestly, personally, I haven't been as active in in organizations like like formally in this. Like one way I do it is, I so the other thing I have two I have two small kids who are you know half Filipino, um, and you know just and they're they're boys. I just try try to constantly educate them, right, about, about the world and and just you know they also are born with some privilege, like being being boys, um, being half white. And so just making sure that I am, um, 
uh, I'm up their upbringing. Um, I'm giving them a, a wide perspective, making sure that they're inclusive. Um, and so that's how, for, from the company perspective, as I mentioned, like we, we um, are a platform for, for sharing stories from one part of the world to the other part of the world, right? You know, we probably heard about Tresa, which is like talking about our Filip uh, Filipino mythologies and Aswangs and Dupalang. So that's an example. Um, so I think that's that's one way our, our company has, uh, Netflix um, has been, has been um, you know, helping, not as directly, is that we, we, are ma we make sure that we share perspectives, um, Asian American and Pacific Islander perspectives. Um, and so just recently, I think this is just May, um, we did launch a, a campaign um, which, <clears throat> which was called, you know, Our Voices, Our Stories, um, Amplifying American and Pacific Islander perspectives. Um, and so if you go to Netflix, you can look at this category and, and it was even uh, drilled down to like AAPI stories for families or Asian American, Asian comedy icons, because because to, I, I think like, and as you probably all, you know, believe to like, be, to, to be able to like reduce the hate, you have to be able to understand each other. And so by really sharing stories and perspectives of people who, who live that, uh, to other people who may look different, um, that's how you, how you reduce hate. And if you realize how they're also experiencing the same things as you, even if they look different, that's how you can build empathy towards people. So that's, I think that was, that's one, you know, purposeful things that I like about Netflix. I think concurrently though, over um, also this, this year, we did sponsor the Act to Change, um, with Act to Change, the third annual National A AAPI Day Against Bullying and Hate. And so we there's, um, can learn more from the Netflix website on that. Definitely. I think from a Google perspective, some of the larger, more public initiatives that we've done is, again, huge donations, right? There are some large um, with national nonprofits within the U.S. that we've been contributing funds to to help um, to, to, to help combat AAPI hate. Two is really around awareness. I think some of the other panelists had shared uh, the importance of getting our stories out there. So one of the big things that Google had done, particularly YouTube, was um, support some of the smaller AAPI like smaller AAPI organizations from a YouTube perspective by providing ad credits so that more of their content could be surfaced to more people. Um, so really getting the visibility out there. I'd say those are the two big ways in which in which Google has um, contributed to, to stopping AAPI hate. In addition to obviously all of the employees such as myself, Filipino Googler Network, um, all of our communities, we've been doing plenty of things voluntarily on our side to, to, to stop AAPI hate. From a personal perspective, um, I sit on the board of uh, Lead Filipino and we have, it's a mix between awareness and also figuring out what are the types of, how can we reimagine um, some of the, for example, uh, policing situations that we get into, right? There has been, I think a lot of social strife, um, some, some, you know, black, white, this, that, like, we're trying to figure out um, from Lead Filipino's perspective, how to really reform the policing space so that everyone can be safe. So it's not just about going and, you know, building awareness about who we are as the AAPI community, but there's also an element of when things do go awry, what's a best way forward for all of us to move forward versus, you know, unfortunately having some of these existing um, structures that don't really help everybody as a group rise. So ERG work is, is something new to me. It's something new to GA. Um, I mean, there's always been that Slack channel that said Asian ERG and, you know, we would post, um, we would post stories and, and articles and things like that. Um, but I think what heightened it was this year and um, or, in, or even the last year where we were being blamed for, for this virus, even though not all of us are part of um, this, you know, this monolith. I refuse to be part of a monolith <laughs> because we're all so different, right? The Philippine culture heritage is so different from the other um, ethnicities, nationalities out there 
that are said to be Asian. Um, but as people put us into this like cluster of like this, this one identity, it made us lose our humanity. And it hurts to say that a lot of folks, even within our own Asian culture, we still don't know much about each other. And that's what I was kind of hoping to do at GA. I'm not, you know, I'm not the person who will wield a sword and, and be that, that frontliner or front facing person to be, you know, saying a lot of things. Um, I mean, I, I do so on social media, but then at the same time, like I'm, yes, I'm an activist, but then like, I'm still behind the scenes activist, you know? Um, I know a lot of my friends go to rallies and they go to, you know, protests, but I'm the one who kind of likes to infiltrate. <laughs> um, so that's what I did at, at GA, you know, like, is there a way that I could send out a link or voice out my opinion when it matters the most? Um, I remember a time at GA, they told me to change a title of my event because it said Brown. Um, and this was before COVID, this, bef this was before the anti-hate or the anti-Asian hate. This was before the anti-Asian hate. And I wrote, I wrote my boss, my boss's boss, a letter saying, this isn't right. You know, why are you trying to censor me? And they said, you know, the person in the copy team said that, you know, it's gonna exclude people. Well, we've been excluded all our lives based on what the, the white patriarchy being the norm. And guess who, guess who flagged my post was a, 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 a white male. So ever since then, I knew that I was risking my job um, bringing that issue up. But at the same time though, I refuse to be part of a company that does not support me or support my people. That's simple. So thank God, you know, that they, that they, you know, took it back. And I, I actually put back the, the word Brown in there and, you know, fast forward a year later, oh, we're here to support our Brown and black brothers and sisters. You know, like the companies that I've been part of, all the companies I feel I've been part of have said some sort of verbiage to say that they do support the, um, you know, the black and brown community. And, you know, some, I've seen some that are, have been very performative, but I think with my company, there really has been an effort to, to up, uplift the black and brown community through scholarships, through more programming, through, um, you know, just giving opportunity for people look like me to rise up the ranks. Because when you look at the, um, when you look at leadership in other companies, you know, majority of them are white male, right? So the events that I put on, um, I really push for paying BIPOC communities. I push for paying women, people of the LGBTQ community, black and brown people. And um, my company has been great at that, you know, like I'm glad that we're being compensated and I'm glad that uh, our voices are being heard. So, I mean, the question is, have, have you been involved in the fight to stop Asian American Pacific Islander hate? I think I've been fighting for Asian American Pacific Islander representation and exposure. Um, because I feel that the hate is always going to be there, you know, but I think what I could offer through my programming and through my business and my company is to show that, you know, Asians are always going to be here. There's no, you know, there's not, not us backing down, you know, we're, we're always going to be here. So what I could do is, is show programming and tell the stories of our people because there's no getting rid of us. <laughs> what does Filipino mean to you? Oh, that's such a good question. I, I think the best word for Filipino is my favorite word is, um, is, is Bayanihan. 
and it's just helping each other. And I was just uh, sharing this just recently with friends about, I just had a reunion with some of my friends from the Philippine Development Foundation. We hadn't seen each other for a couple of years and having the weekend together with with my closest Filipino friends was so invigorating. We were talking about new programs that we want to put together for the next generation of Filipino leaders. And that was inspiring, but was mostly deeply moving was this sense that I can hardly put into words of feeling deeply loved and deeply supported, uh, even after we hadn't seen each other for years. And um, that meant a lot to me. And that to me is what Filipino meant. It was the deep unconditional love that I'm going to help them. They're going to help me. We're all there for each other. And what inspired me the most was, was wanting to give that feeling to everybody else around me. Being Filipino um, definitely means family to me. Um, I feel like no matter where I go, I find family. Um, you know, I can meet somebody, find out they're Filipino and make an instant connection. And I found that it's not just, it's not unique to being in the Philippines. It's actually more pronounced as you travel outside. So San Francisco, we have a large Filipino community. You know, it's, I used to joke that you can go to any Filipino store and you'd find friends there who you never even knew, um, that you never even knew you had. And that's just the sense of community and family that everyone exudes when you meet them. Family. Ah, you know, it's just a summation of all my experiences um, from the day I was born where, you know, I was made to sing and dance in front of my family, um, having the bond of my, you know, my sisters and, and, and friends. And um, yeah, it, I, I think there's no way to describe it because also it's, you know, it's, it's, it's very different for person, but it's just, it's really just a summation of everything that I've been through. I think Erin said it best when she mic dropped <laughs> uh, family. Um, for me, it's not just about you know, my immediate family. I am very close to them, but it's amazing to me that anytime I go anywhere, if I see a Filipino, we do that look and it's over. Like you are, you will be taken care of. You will be, somebody has your back. As a great example, I was in uh, the San Francisco International Airport. I went to Goldilocks. I was telling the woman, oh my God, like it's the first time I'm having Goldilocks in like over a year. Filipino lady, she was like, oh, you're Filipino too? Bet, discount, free food, like, let me take care of you. And behind the mask, we don't know each other's names, nothing. And she was just like, let me, let me take care of you, right? It's, it's, for me, being Filipino is being part of a ridiculously large family where anywhere you go in the world, you are bound to find someone that is, that will take care of you. Filipino means everything to me but you know just to get into more more detail it, cup of buy-in you know togetherness um knowing that people are always going to be there for you when when you're down i think the i think family and togetherness even even if they're not blood family even if like they're chosen family um that's what being filipino is to you and to me and um, being Filipino is sharing your culture, sharing what you got, no matter how little you have. Um, I think Filipinos are always ready to support and protect when they need to. And, you know, especially food. Filipinos love their food. So it's definitely <laughs> pictures and food. I'm such a tita. I'm such a tita. Family, pictures and food, and all that means memories. So. Okay. <laughs> what is your favorite Filipino food? Oh, I do. Uh, I know that everybody has a lot of favorite Filipino foods, but I have one that's particularly important to me right now. There is a chocolatier in the Mission District of San Francisco called Kokak Chocolates, K-O-K-A-K, -K -K, in the Mission, 18th and Mission. And uh, the woman who started it is Carol Garcia. She's Filipino born and raised. 
and go to the website. She makes handcrafted chocolates that are hand each hand painted. There are flavors like calamansi, Earl Grey, coconut, pineapple, everything you could possibly imagine and beyond things that you can imagine. Uh, you have to try it if you haven't tried it yet. Kokak Chocolates in the Mission, Carol Garcia. That tends to be tricky. I always say kare kare is my favorite Filipino food. I have too many. Uh, I wrote them down. Kare kare, pork sisig, dessert, thrown halo halo, anything with pineapple, mango. Uh, santol is like the most amazing food ever. And Filipino spaghetti with pineapple, my mom's, because we're kabong and that's how we do it. Recently, I've been um, obsessed with making bibinka, and um, and my, my kids love it too. Um, and so I'm gonna experiment. We have a we are taking a bunch of time in August. I'm gonna experiment with different flavors of bibinka. My favorite Filipino food, hands down, is chicken adobo uh, with no milk. That's a big debate in the Filipino Googler Network and FGN whether or not there's milk in your adobo. So for me, no milk. <laughs> Um, and do you have any a small business that you'd like to promote now? Manila Bowl, which is a local business here, has sustained my family throughout um, uh, through the early days of lockdown. We used to order meals from them. Um, and it's a small local business that um, I'm now friends with the owner. She, you know, a lot of restaurants had trouble during the uh, the initial stages of lockdown in the Bay Area um, and a lot of restaurants had to pivot and their pivot was to provide Filipino meals, um, both to frontliners and um, reduce their catering uh, minimums so that they could serve families as well. And we did, we did a lot of that <laughs> for sure. I have so many. We're actually building out a database for this for faster. It's not launched on the website. We've been rebranding it for quite some time. But, you know, during the pandemic, um, I had a couple of deaths in the family, you know, whether it was COVID or something else. So I buy a lot of candles. I like candles every day. It's also a very Filipino religious thing. So the one I have here is Wicked Candila. It's a, the cousin of one of our faster advisors. Um, so I had that link in the chat. It's Sampagita scented. And the other one um, I would plug is Santos Candles out of LA. All their proceeds or portions of the proceeds for theirs. Yes, that's the one that um, Alex has. That's my other favorite is, is Mangosteen flavored. Um, and it goes to SIPA search to involve Filipino Americans. And so I think, you know, in terms of like, you know, Filipino scents, which smells like a Filipino fruit or flower. I love all of that. So those would be the two. And my last one would be Shades of Sugar Bake Shop. It's um, it's actually a a API and queer owned. Um, that person's partner also, Chris um, Toshira Hoxson is, is Filipino and Japanese, one of my classmates. Um, they helped work with us at Faster to do themed boxes for Pride Month this year in June. Um, and as well as, um, you know, in response to Black Lives Matter, really making sure our communities, anytime someone buys like a faster t-shirt, like for everything that we purchased for past speakers, you know, as a, a thank you, we also made sure to take all of those funds um, and donate back to Black Lives Matter by also purchasing um, Shades of Sugar Bake Shop macarons. So double chocolate's really good as well. Uh, you know, I like food. So the first thing I think about is the um, recent Filipino food I've had in San Francisco and specifically the food trucks. So I really like the Longonisa uh, burrito from Senor Sisig. And I believe it's a wrap shop. I also like their halo halo uh, tea, I think, where, where you just package a halo halo in a glass, in, in a bottle of tea. At 100% my earrings. Thank you, brown girls. <laughs> uh, that's probably the, the Filipino uh, company that I most often shop. <laughs> um, it being uh, Kumu that is um, sponsoring Pistahan, I would like to say a few words about Kumu if that's possible. Um, in addition to me being an events producer for GA and um, 
loving everything about what GA stands for and what work I put into GA. Um, I do want to mention Kumu, which is the first Philippine based live streaming app. And, you know, Kumu has kind of changed lives <laughs> um, because of the pandemic. People didn't know exactly what was happening, what was what was going to happen with the world. And I think with Kumu, it connected a lot of folks. And, and in my own personal life, I was able to meet people who would change the, tra the trajectory of my life. And knowing that personal communication, whether it be virtual or in person, can change a person. Um, I think that's what was missing from a lot of Filipinos' lives was that communication, that, that togetherness that I mentioned earlier about what being Filipino is all about. And with Kumu, because we were able to connect with people thousands, hundreds of miles away, our networks have grown. We've uh, gotten new ways to grow together. And knowing that this app was founded and developed by a group of Philams, that's pretty wonderful. And knowing that we could do so much more with our people, um, to share culture, to share ourselves on this app has been quite a life-changing thing. So being a community manager for Kumu not only got me more connected with my roots, with my people, but it showed me a new side of myself, being a person in tech now. Um, you know, I, I am doing events and running virtual programs on Kumu and seeing the back end and the business side of Kumu. And it's given me a, a chance to grow and meet so, so many wonderful people and develop programming with folks on my, in my personal life, on my team. So yeah, it's, Kumu's great. Kumu's great. And I'm not just saying that because I'm being paid to. Caveat or a disclaimer, I am an employee of Kumu. <laughs> but but on the real though, Kumu has been such a great platform for people in the major cities of the Philippines and even in the provinces of the Philippines just to make connections, connections that the pandemic has taken away. So I hope that more people get on Kumu. Um, and you know, like I said before, there's so much talent in the Philippines and Kumu is a place where that talent can flourish. So that's all I wanted to say. That's all I got to say. <laughs> Bye.